Good morning. Um, about 42 years ago, I was asked to head up the project uh, to develop a universal product code. Now that uh, that project that project uh, went on for two and a half years. I didn't take when I left McKinsey. I didn't take any notes or documents. So given that it's 42 years ago, and given my uh, memory at the moment, I'll do my best to remember uh, most of the important points, but I'm probably not going to have all the specific dates and so forth, so pardon me for that. Let me start by saying that I was privileged to meet the famous Wally Flint, who is said to have put into his uh, master's thesis at Harvard Business School a dissertation dealing with checkout automation. Now, I never read it but I believe it was there, and that was a long time ago. That was 80 years ago. Uh, going a little bit further along, between the 1960s and 1970s, many computers were actually becoming real and feasible, which was one of the key underpinnings uh, for the success of this program, or the feasibility of this program. Uh, and now in 1965, uh, I was at the time uh, working for TRW, working on uh, weapons of mass destruction. And I was recruited uh, by a, a person by the name of John Clark from Booz Allen Hamilton. And I'm going to come back to John because he, he played in the later years a pivotal role, believe it or not, in this project. I, d of course, didn't go with Booz Allen. I did, in fact, go with McKinsey and joined them in 1967. Uh, and that's after I finished uh, three degrees. I passed up uh, the Booz Allen opportunity, went to McKinsey. And another key person uh, uh, was instrumental in my joining McKinsey. His name is Andy Pearson. He's since passed, uh, but he was in charge of the uh, grocery industry relationships that we had at McKinsey. He and I hit it off real well, and I was actually hired the day of the first interview. So, uh, but Andy comes back later on in terms of a key, uh, key person. Uh, we, uh, in 1967, we had an assignment from uh, Mayor Lindsay, uh, which required us and in turn me to model the entire power generation system in New York City to determine ways in which the city could reduce uh, pollution. Uh, and that parametric model proved to be a very powerful tool and yielded, uh, frankly, it yielded solutions that most people didn't realize were uh, appropriate or necessary or even feasible. I also had the assignment to model the entire housing uh, market in New York City, all five boroughs. That required 25 databases, seven link programs, and we ran the parametric models uh, on a timeshare computer that took eight hours to run a simulation. So I had a little background in developing models that were useful in making uh, very important policy decisions. Now, in the late 1960s, and I don't know exactly the date, but Jack Struby, who was then executive vice president at Kroger, and the industrial engineering manager, uh, Bob Cottrell, uh, were quite interested in figuring out a way to improve the productivity of a food re a grocery retailer. Uh, they invited the folks from the uh, Princeton laboratory, I think it was Fran Beck, to come out and look around, understand the numbers, and suggest things that might help productivity. They came up with two ideas that became a reality. First, stacker cranes. Stacker cranes in warehouses that, that reached up to the second and third story in order to get greater density, greater efficiency, and oh, by the way, automation in the picking operations. The second thing they came up with was checkout automation a fascinating and important uh, way of improving productivity uh, because at the time grocery stores were had a gross margin of uh, approximately 20 percent at the bottom line they were earning about one to one and a half percent on sales and it turns out that the checker bagger costs were equal to about 25 percent of the gross margin or five to six percentage points which was a multiple of what they were then making and so if you could increase uh, the productivity of the checker bagger, you could more than double or even triple the profitability of a, of a chain. Uh, a major, major opportunity. Uh, the NAFC, uh, knowing that RCA took the bit and in fact went back to develop uh, a, a prototype, do some testing and so forth, 
uh, Clancy Atomy and, and others in the various trade organizations, particularly Mike O'Connor from SMI, got together and tried to establish, immediately establish, a code that would facilitate this automation opportunity. And they were struggling uh, with the need to make a, a code that was short enough to fit on the packages and long enough to accommodate all the items uh, that were sold in grocery stores at the time. By the way, at that time, uh, the average supermarket had about 10,000 uh, items uh, in it, and there were about a million items uh, that, were, uh, that were sold in grocery stores throughout the United States, not counting store door things like milk and ice cream and so forth. Anyway, uh, as things went on, uh, the manufacturers uh, preferred a much longer code, an 11-digit code, as I recall. And so there was a, there was a controversy uh, with regard to, quote, how long the code should be. No discussion about a symbol or machine-readable representation of the code, but a lot of controversy about the length of the code. Somewhere in that period, uh, McKinsey did get a preliminary study to consider code length. And we had our computer expert, Harvey Gollop, a look into it. And he came back to the management and said, gentlemen, you're only looking at the tip of an iceberg. This is not the real issue. The issue is much bigger. And so I, I don't know whether we even delivered a report, but we did, we did identify the iceberg. 